people see you. Have you ever wondered? Most of us at some point have wondered how other people see us. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a passage in Scripture where we have a glimpse of how, we have an idea of how we see this person. We all have an idea of who he is. But I hope this morning that we're going to have a little different idea at the end. And I also hope that one of the things we'll learn is that how we are seen by other people isn't the thing that that defines who we are, but instead what defines who we are is how God sees us. And not only that, but how we understand how God sees us changes when we understand how we see God. When we understand God more clearly, we understand ourselves more clearly and how he sees us. We're going to read this passage this morning about Doubting Thomas, so I invite you to follow along. It's in John chapter 19, verses John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. And if you, you can follow in the Pew Bible, but if you have your own Bible, I encourage you to open it and keep it open because we're going to look back at it throughout the course of the sermon. Got to get our, there we go. So John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus again said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven then. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. These are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and and through believing you may have life in his name. So I was talking earlier about how people see you, and I had this moment of truth where I discovered how people see me. And it was when I was 38 years old. I hadn't been back home to Minnesota where I grew up for a long time. And I went back and I was there and I was going somewhere with some friends of mine that I grew up with. And I saw his parents and my other friend's parents. And I hadn't seen them in about 25 years. And we get together and the first thing I do is say, hey, Ryan, good to see you, all this stuff. And then they say, do you remember that time when you were at our cabin and you decided you were going to jump your bike off the end of the dock. Now, here's what happened. They lived, they had this cabin, and they had this long dock that went out into the lake, and at the end of the dock, it was about eight feet deep. And I had this idea that I was going to take a bike, and I was going to start, their cabin was up on a hill, and there was a little driveway that came down, down to the dock, so they could bring their boat up and down in and out of the boathouse. So I had this idea, I was 13 years old, I was going to take a bike, and I was going to start at the top of the hill. And I was going to go down, and I was going to hit the dock, and I was going to be going super fast, and there was going to be a ramp at the end, and I was going to hit this ramp, and I was going to go head over heels and dive head first in to the lake when the bike dropped below me. That was my plan, and I was 13, and I was certain it was going to work. So I spent a while getting the whole thing set up. I had a little bridge that took me from the driveway to the dock, And then I was going to ride on the dock, and I was going to go out, and I was going to hit this jump, and I was going to launch. I had it all set, and I had a friend sitting there on the edge of the dock with a camera, and everybody was up on the deck of the cabin ready to watch my feet. 
I'm up on my bike, and I go racing down this hill, and I had a great head of steam. I'm going fast, and then I go over the little bridge, and I hit the dock, and I hit the dock, and what I hadn't realized is two things. Number one, the dock was wet, and number two, it was slippery. So I get on there, and I could feel I was losing it, but, but I was keeping going, and I was moving pretty fast, and I kind of maintained it, and I got to the end of the dock, and I started to slide sideways, and I was losing it, but I was bound and determined to hit the jump. So I hit it with my front wheel, and, and the jump broke off and fell in water. And then I went in head over heels and landed, and the handlebar of the bike went right into my thigh. And in the water, and I'm in there for a while, and I, it was pretty painful, I have to confess. That makes for a better story when your mic comes unplugged. And then, so I go in, and I had this huge bruise on my thigh, and I popped out. I'm like, I'm all right, I'm all right, but I wasn't all right. I was in bad shape, and my thigh was bruised, and it blew up, and I could barely walk for the rest of the weekend. And I look up at the deck where everyone was standing, and they didn't look too concerned. They were laughing hysterically at me. But that's not the worst part of it. The worst part of it is 25 years later, I go back and I see them for the first time in two and a half decades. And what's the first thing? Hey, Ryan, how you doing? Remember when you slipped off the end of our dock and fell on the lake and looked like a fool? And, and this is the problem. They didn't say I looked like a fool. That was me. But this is, this is the problem. After that happened, I thought to myself, I went to college. I have a graduate degree. I stayed married for quite a while. I have kids. I, 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 I am a pastor. I may not be the most accomplished person in the world, but I've done a few things. They didn't ask about that. They just said, we remember you as the 13-year-old kid who slid off the end of the dock and bruised your leg and limped around for the rest of the weekend. Now, it was just this moment when I realized sometimes what we're remembered for is life's most embarrassing moments. But it gets worse. It, I didn't have the worst of it. I'm going to show you a picture, and if you're a baseball fan at all, you're going to know. You're going to know who this guy is and what he did. Bill Buckner, 1986, Game 6 of the World Series, routine ground ball down the first baseline, two outs in the ninth inning. He reaches down to get it, and it goes between his legs. If he just made the play, Red Sox win. He misses the play, Mets win. Not only that, they go on to win Game 7, and he's the goat of all history in baseball. And whenever anyone sees Bill Buckner, they think of that moment when the ball went between his legs, when he missed the play. They don't think of the fact that he had a very successful 21-year baseball career. They don't remember that he was better than an average player. He was a very good player for a long time. But that's not what people think of. They think of that moment when the ball went between his legs choked. When you say Bill Buckner to a baseball fan, they think the guy who blew the 86 World Series. And this morning in our scripture, we looked at a guy who's been hung with a label that stuck with him for 2,000 years, Doubting Thomas. Now, to some degree, it seems as though he earned the title because we know that there were two situations where he was kind of the doubter among the group. In John 14, Jesus said that he was going to prepare a place for his disciples. And he says, if I'm going there to prepare a place for you, I will bring you with me. Because where I am, there you will be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. And that's one of those moments, you know, like in school when the teacher or the professor says something and nobody knows the answer, so everyone looks at their shoes. And no one will ask a question because we don't want to show that we don't know. Well, Thomas he chimes in and he says, actually, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The second time we see Thomas as the one who was doubtful is in the passage that we read today. At the beginning of the passage, it's, it's Easter Sunday night. Jesus had met Mary in the garden, and she had recognized him, and she tried to embrace him, and he told her not to hang on to me. 
and then she went back and she told the disciples, but apparently they didn't quite yet believe. So then it says, while the door was locked, Jesus showed up in the midst of them and he said, peace be with you. And then it says, he showed his hands and his side and the disciples believed and rejoiced. They saw the evidence. But then the passage tells us that Thomas was missing in that moment. He wasn't there, and we don't know where he was. And Thomas came back, and they told him what happened, and he didn't quite believe it. And that's why we call him Doubting Thomas. It's because he didn't believe what the disciples had told him. I love this writer, Frederick Beekner and the way he writes about biblical characters. And he writes about Doubting Thomas, and here's what he says about him. He says, Imagination was not Thomas's strong suit. He called a spade a spade. He was a realist. He didn't believe in fairy tales. And if anything else came up that he didn't believe in or couldn't understand, his questions could be pretty direct. Nobody says where Thomas was at the time. One good thing about not having too much of an imagination is you're not as apt to work yourself up into quite as much of a panic as Thomas's friends had, for example. And maybe he'd gone out for a cup of coffee or just to sit in the park for a while and watch the pigeons. Anyway, when he finally returned and they told him what had happened, his reaction was just about what they might have expected. He said that unless Jesus came back again so that he could not, so that he could not only see the nail marks for himself but actually touch them, he was afraid that as much as he hated to say so, he simply couldn't believe what they had seen was anything more than a product of wishful thinking or an optical illusion of an unusually vivid kind. Thomas didn't believe him, not because he was a doubter so much, but perhaps because Thomas was the ultimate realist. Maybe we've given Thomas the wrong name. Maybe instead of doubting Thomas, we should call him perfectly reasonable Thomas. Because Thomas heard the story about Jesus showing, in the midst, showing up in the midst of all the disciples, and his response wasn't ridiculous, it was perfectly reasonable. Thomas said, well, I'm glad you told me that, but I don't believe it until I've seen it for myself and touched his hands and put my finger in his side. Then I will believe, but not until that happens. Thomas was perfectly reasonable. You know, I'm actually fascinated by this idea of of doubt and faith. And I'm not actually so fascinated by doubters like, you know, like Richard Dawkins and the new atheists who don't believe in anything at all. They don't fascinate me. To me, they're fairly simple to understand. I'm more fascinated by believers. Believers who trust in Jesus, but yet at the same time live with doubts and questions that we struggle with and try to come to terms with. The reason I'm so fascinated with it is because it's something that all of us live with and something all of us manage and something all of us work with throughout our lives and something that we we have to deal with throughout the course of our Christian lives. How do we deal with doubts? And one of the things I find so fascinating about it is that scriptures never shy away from doubt. As a matter of fact, right here in the Easter narratives and the stories of Jesus' resurrection, there's doubt sown right in the middle of it. It's not that everybody saw and believed immediately. It's not that everybody heard the word at the first moment and believed it. There were some who questioned, some who were eminently reasonable, who questioned whether what they were seeing was really true. And there's something about Thomas that I appreciate. I appreciate Thomas' skepticism for one reason. I think that Thomas understood something about human nature. That human beings have this deep desire to make the world fit the way that we want it to be. Thomas wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see him for himself because he didn't necessarily believe the word of the other disciples. And why is that? I think it's perhaps because Thomas was afraid that the vision of Jesus, not the reality, but the vision that they had seen that he feared, was actually a projection of what they wanted to see, not the real risen Christ. So I want you to think about the evidence that Thomas demanded. What did Thomas ask for? Thomas said, I'll believe it. 
I'll believe it when I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side. But until then, I won't believe it. I think it's, I think it's significant that what Thomas wanted to see, what was going to be compelling evidence for him, was not evidence of the glorified Jesus, but instead evidence of the crucified Jesus, the one who had suffered and died for us and for our salvation. Not that Jesus had been raised in a glorified body, but instead that he, even as the resurrected one, is also the one who has been crucified. Because isn't that really what we need to see? Isn't that the evidence that we need? You know, the reality is, I don't find it that difficult to believe when life is going great. When my finances are in order, when my job's going well, when my family is all together and it seems like everything's going well, those are not the times that I struggle to believe. It's when our health is failing, when our finances are a mess, when our family is going in multiple directions and we wonder how it's all going to turn out. That's when we wonder. That's when we begin to doubt. Not when things are going well, but when things are hard. And Thomas was only going to be convinced when he saw Jesus had gone through these difficult, trying, suffering times. Because then he would know that that really is the Lord. Because he was the one who suffered for us and for our salvation. And here's the thing that really strikes me. Jesus' response to Thomas. Notice what Jesus says. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. What strikes me about that is this. That if it were me, or probably most of us in this room, we would have shown up and said, Thomas, these guys already told you. Why didn't you believe them? You saw me for all this time, and and you still didn't trust. But Jesus doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, I want you to know Jesus does not give Thomas the title of Doubting Thomas. We are the ones who have given Thomas the title of Doubting Thomas. Because that is apparently not the way that Jesus sees him. Jesus sees him as a follower, as a child of God, as one whom he loves, as one of his friends. To whom he wants to reveal himself so that Thomas will have a better understanding of who Jesus is and who God is. And what's Thomas's response? Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Thomas's response is the strongest statement of faith in all of the Gospels. So why do we call him Doubting Thomas? Maybe we should call him Believing Thomas. Because Thomas saw and believed when he encountered the risen Jesus Christ. And then after that, Jesus turns from Thomas and he, he turns and he looks at us and he says, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. When Jesus says that, he's talking to people like us. Who haven't seen his hands in the sides with our own eyes, but who have come to believe anyway. Based on the testimony of his witnesses. Based on the testimony of the Holy Spirit. In our passage this morning, we have Thomas. Who's been given this label of doubting Thomas. I hope for us that that's not the label that endures. That's not the label that Jesus gave him. That's not the way that Jesus saw him. Jesus instead saw him as a beloved follower whom he invited to see Jesus more clearly so that he could understand God more clearly. And then I think of ourselves. What are the labels that we've been given in life? How have other people seen me? What have other people said about me? It doesn't really matter in the end. Because that's not how Jesus sees me. Jesus sees us as his beloved children. People that are made in his image and people whom he loves. For whom he gave his life. 
And He reveals Himself to us so that we can see Him more clearly. And when He reveals Himself to us and we see Him more clearly, it's also so that we can see ourselves more clearly. So that we see ourselves as people who are loved and beloved by God. People who have been given life by Jesus through His suffering, through His death, through His resurrection. Jesus who has offered Himself to us so that we can know Him and love Him and serve Him. How does the world see you? I don't know. In the end, it doesn't matter. How does Jesus see us? That we do know. He sees us as people who love and care for Thanks be to God for that. Let us pray.